voice. <laughs> the voice. Good morning to everybody and welcome as always to History Matters. And coffee really matters this morning, I will say. And you can tell because I put the cover on upside down. So that's a sign that I really need my coffee this morning. I noticed it like right before I came on. It was like, if you're, if you're noticing details like that, sure sign. Uh, at any rate, um, what we are going to be um, talking about, let me do this, today uh, is fear. I obviously sat yesterday uh too late in the week for as always for me to ponder this and thought well you know halloween is coming up there must be a halloween appropriate um topic that we're going to be talking about what would that be and i was trying to think of scary stories you know a variety of different things from the past and then i thought no nah, freeman we talked about and i always refer to myself <laughs> by my last name freeman um we talked about hate uh and fear it's a different conversation and probably needs to be talked about too so that is our topic today but before we plunge into that conversation um i will turn to my partner in crime matt who will explain the rules of the game and good morning everybody thank you for joining us today thank you for being here and um, and we hope that you enjoy your time here today. Um, the rules of the game are as follows. We encourage you to use chat. Please use chat, write in chat, tell us all the things. We do enjoy that. Um, <laughs> tell us all the things. <laughs> <laughs> all the things. We do, we do enjoy it. Um, uh, just as always, try to keep it as germane to the conversation as possible. And of course, family friendly. If you do have questions for Joanne, uh, you can put those in the Q and A at the bottom of your screen. We encourage you to do that. Uh, we have, you all have been killing it with the questions lately. So lots of questions, love the questions, keep up the questions, um, looking forward to those questions, but put them in the Q&A. That way I do not lose track of them if you happen to put them in chat. And as always, if you like what we're doing here at the National Council for History Education, please join us. You can visit us on the web at www.mcheteach.org and look around, look at all our new content, all our new programming, all our new webinars, all our new everything. That's good. Things are moving along here at National Council for History Education, and it's all for you. So please join us. Check it out. Um, we're really excited to uh, share uh, the work that we're doing with uh, the population out there. Um, all of, as we say, us, all, all of our stakeholders is, is, is the right word. So we really do appreciate it and uh, hope that you take some time to check us out. With that, I'll turn it back over to Joanne and hide away, and we will talk about fear. Thank you. And stakeholder sounds like an 18th century word. So I, it does. <laughs> I appreciate that. I do. Um, okay. So here, first of all, um, to everyone, hang on a minute here. Let me, do, there we go. Um, first of all, to everybody, happy almost Halloween, uh, which obviously helped me in deciding on the theme here. Um, and I, so I, I thought, as I suggested a moment ago, what will I talk about? Halloween's coming something Halloween related, I, I guess I'll, I'll, in one way or another, I'll see if I can talk about fear, fright, scared, something. I was trying desperately casting about. Um, and then I thought, no, actually fear um, is pretty relevant now, uh, as far as our, the times that we're living in, and always in one way or another has been important in the way that uh, America, the United States conducts itself um, on a lot of levels, socially, politically, as far as even as far as statecraft is concerned, which I'm going to come back to in a moment. So that really is what I want to um, talk about today. I will say that when I first started thinking about this, um, I started, well, I'm going to recreate that for you because I think it's going to segue us into talking about fear in the way that I want to talk about it for today's conversation. Um, Initially, I just did what I always do, which is sort of cast my brain over <laughs> American history and the things that I've recently worked on to think about what popped into my head. And um, the first thing I thought of, of a fear was in the founding era, fear of democracy, right? And I thought particularly in, at some point in semi-recent weeks, um, I talked about the last letters that um, Hamilton and Jefferson wrote and Hamilton's last letter essentially talks about the greatest threat to the Republic, which he says is democracy, right? So one of the things I thought of in thinking about this episode um, yesterday and this morning was, okay, fear of democracy. Hamilton is an example of that. Um, if you were to ask him what he was afraid of, 
he would probably say um, disorder, disrule, demagoguery, <laughs> all the D words. Um, he would have a variety of reasons why he thought democracy was dangerous. Probably the one he would not say, but which would also be true, would be fear of a threat to elite white rule of the Republic, right? So part of what he would be afraid of is, um, in his mind, disorder would be the prevailing order that he was living in and that he assumed was best for the Republic, which was the, the rule of people who were very much like him, that being threatened in some way and potentially bringing the Republic down. So fear of democracy would be partly fear of losing what he thought the order should be and the order that the social and political order should be with people like him at the top. So then I thought, okay, that's kind of a layered way of thinking about fear. It seems like you're afraid of something. You're pointing your finger at something. You're saying you, the masses are unruly, very 18th century way of describing it. You are the unruly masses who will bring down the Republic. There's a reason why monarchies succeed because they don't give so much power to the unruly masses. That's a lot of finger pointing, but in the end, part of that finger pointing has to do with your sense of order being threatened in the way that you want order to be. So then I thought, okay, another example of fear in my recent work. And I thought um, in the most recent book on um, physical violence in Congress, one of the things that struck me when I was writing about um, Southern slaveholders uh, in Congress and their um, fear, what they were afraid of, what they acknowledged being afraid of and what they were really afraid of, also obviously linked to what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, I thought about the fact that um, certainly no one Northern or Southern would enjoy being humiliated before the public, before a national public and the press on the floor of Congress. So that would be true North and South. No one wants to be humiliated. We don't wanna be humiliated either. However, there were interesting comments that I remember when I was researching my book among these Southerners who in one way or another um, really didn't want to be shown to be weak or fearful on the floor of Congress. And I, I don't have the precise quote, so I'm gonna give you a, a bad paraphrase of it. Um, but what one Southerner said, very close to the truth, was something along the lines of, um, we can't be shown to be weak here. I mean, if we don't defend ourselves here, if we don't stand up for what we believe in and really basically knock down people who threaten our rule and our order, what will people think back home? What will the people we enslave back home think of us? Now that's getting at the layered kind of fear that I wanna talk about this morning because what that Southerner in particular is saying is, yeah, yeah, I don't wanna be humiliated. I'm afraid of being humiliated in Congress. I don't like the idea. I'm gonna do whatever it takes to not be humiliated that way. I don't want that to happen. Why? Not just because he fears being humiliated, but because he fears being, in a sense, um, responsible for the behavior that he's engaged in back home. He, feel, he fears that if he looks weak on the national stage, that somehow or other the dominance that he takes for granted back home will be threatened. That's a, that's a more layered kind of fear. That's not just, I'm scared of this. That's my kind of like with Hamilton in democracy, right? I'm afraid of the unruly masses. Why? Because the, the power structure, the order that I think the world should be in with me at the top, of course, might be threatened. And in the case of Southerners, that's an order that's grounded on violence. So it's not just dominance, but it's dominance enforced by violence against the enslaved. So there again, it's, it's fear, they're afraid of something, but the reason why they're afraid even in an even more striking way than perhaps Hamilton suggested is they're afraid of their actions, the way that they're maintaining rule back home, which is through violence. They're afraid of that being threatened, of their dominance being threatened. So in a sense, that's what I wanted to talk about this morning was this idea that if you look, um, take the long view of American history, a lot of what is, what may appear on the surface. So probably when you saw that I was gonna be talking about fear in American history or fear and 
um, American politics or however it is you came into this discussion, um, you probably, it's easy to think of any number of ways in which um, fear, particularly now, is being used as a motivator, um, as a, a political tool. Um, but in a way, part of what I wanna talk about this morning really is this layered way of using fear in which you're pointing your finger at someone that you're saying you're afraid of, but in doing that, what you're really saying is that you're afraid of you losing the dominance of power that you assume that you're entitled to have. Um, so that what you're talking about is fear of repercussions or fear of responsibility or fear of that word I talk about oh so often here on History Matters, accountability. An example of that, think about throughout American history or certainly through a big chunk of it, the amount of fear that white settlers had towards Native Americans, right? They're scary, they're savage, they're all of the things that, that, um, that these settlers of various sorts sort of beamed onto Native Americans and why they were scared of them. Now, granted, you know, if, if they were here with us, right, those people might say, yeah, well, they, you know, they're scary and they, they attack us and they're cruel and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right. However, the reason for the fear, the reason why Native Americans are behaving in that manner is because these settlers are encroaching on their lands, right? So fear among these, these excuse me, <clears throat> these settlers, fear is fear of the behavior, the repercussions for their actions, right? They're encroaching on land, Native Americans are responding with violence. And then the settlers or wannabe settlers are pointing and saying, we're scared of them, they're bad, they're scary, they're bad. It's like, well, they're scary and bad because you are encroaching on their land. So what you're engaging in is finger pointing really about something that you yourself are instigating, but rather than seeing any form of that, you of course assume you're entitled to the land and they are scary bad people who you should be scared of because they're doing crazy bad violent things against you, the you know innocent settlers. Again, fear as a kind of layered complex thing where yeah, okay, if you ask these people, they'd say they were afraid of Native Americans who are scary people, but the fear really is about the response that they're garnering because of their actions, right? So fear in the way that I'm talking about it this morning in one way or another often has to do with fear of not being in control, fear of not having dominance, fear of not having what you feel entitled to, fear of not being on the, the top of the, the power heap. Um, and I think you can happily march through, maybe not happily is not the right word, unhappily march through American history and see again and again and again people pointing fingers at scary others, and in one way or another trying to put down physically or otherwise, scary others who are somehow inferior to you or cruder than you or less controlled than you, you know, less civilized than you or whatever it is that you want to attach to the finger pointing. But in essence, what you're really doing is pointing fingers because you are afraid that your power, your understanding of the power order of the world might be threatened, and those scary others are the people who might threaten the power order, not necessarily through violence, but just by standing up against what you assume is the way that things ought to be. So what I'm talking about is a layered understanding of fear, and I also want to talk about the, the dynamics at the heart of it. And this gets us, this will kind of segue us into the modern era. Um, because the dynamics are key when you think about this way of finger pointing and blaming uh, others for a situation that in one way or another, you are helping to instigate. When you're doing all of this finger pointing at others as being bad and scary and someone needs to deal with them and silence them or stifle them or round them up or put them somewhere or whatever needs to happen so that you, the person on the top can feel safe, the best way to make that argument is not to say, I'm scared, but to say, we're being victimized, right? We're being victimized by a scary other. These scary people who don't know how to behave, they're victimizing us. We are victims. And as victims, we have the right to stand up for ourselves. You can see the chain of 
emotional logic built right in there, right? This is the power of victimization, which is something that obviously couldn't be more relevant and immediate to us right now. If you can portray yourself as a victim of someone else who's evil or bad or dangerous or scary, then you are justified in doing things to defend yourself against these horrible people who are victimizing you. And what that does normally, that's a, that's a very logical way for you to reason your way into extreme action. If you're being victimized in one way or another, if you truly are under attack, then you're defending yourself. And that in a sense seems to justify more extreme behavior in self-defense, right? And that's not an abstract thought, that's a general thought. But when we're talking about finger pointing and, and blame, if you can make yourself out to be a victim, you can justify in some situations, violence against the others who are the aggressors, who are attacking you, who are behaving improperly, who are threatening, who seemingly are inviting that kind of violent retribution. So victimization, you know, we talk, we hear a lot of talk about that um, in the media. We see a lot of discussion of that. It is all around us right now in our current political moment. But victimization, claiming that you're a victim, although it's tempting to see that as a, as a stance of weakness, it isn't. It's a way of justifying extreme action. If you can sincerely convince people that you are being victimized, then you, in a sense, are um, morally justified in doing what you must do to defend yourself. So victimization can be a power move. Claiming that you're a victim can be a power move. Um, you know, it, it, of course, this is what it makes me think of, but it, it's a great example of um, seeing this in, in concrete action. Of course, when I'm thinking about always wanting to be the victim and being able to use that in your uh, defense, I suppose, by claiming I'm a victim so I can do whatever it takes, I immediately, my mind goes back to something I've studied a lot, which is dueling, right? the practice of dueling. When you look at how the dynamics of a duel play out, inevitably, the person who wants the duel wants to look like a victim wants to be the one that can essentially say, you have insulted me and I am thus left with no choice but to initiate an affair of honor because you, you have victimized me, you have insulted me. When you see people maneuvering their way into a duel, what you see almost always in one way or another is each person on each side trying to say to the other one, you insulted me, I am the victim. And thus, I feel I need to initiate an affair of honor. You don't look bloodthirsty. You don't look like you're, you know, literally gunning for violence. You don't look like you want this bad thing to happen. You look like this sort of virtuous person who is standing up for yourself against this horrible person who has attacked you. So putting yourself in the stance of a victim, while on the surface of it seems like a move of weakness, is not. It's a move of self-justification. It, it can be a power move. And I do think that a lot of what we're looking at in American politics today, and a lot of it is happening on the right, is this sense that if you portray yourself as a victim, a constant victim, and you need to do something to stand up for your rights, your freedom, what you feel that you deserve, that's a powerful argument, right? And it's a persuasive argument. Um, it's an argument that underneath it, uh, at, at the sort of lower level of, of logic there is saying, I deserve a certain amount of power and I feel like it's being threatened. And so I'm gonna do what I can to keep that power and maybe even boost that power. It's a power move, but it's a power move done in a way that, that almost calls for support and certainly justifies extreme action. So that's in a sense that the scary story that um, I wanted to and have been talking about this morning is that very idea, which is the way that portraying yourself as a victim can be the logic behind extreme violence against others. If you can persuasively show to your satisfaction and the satisfaction of others who are like-minded that you're victims, that's going to justify in one way or another often violence. And it's going to seem like justified violence. It's going to seem as though you're putting things in their right order, when what you're really doing is protecting what you feel entitled to, 
right? Protecting a certain level of power, the way things are, what you feel entitled to. It's a power move, it's a move of entitlement, but it's a really effective one because what you're su suggesting is, I, I am a victim, I don't have power. These other scary people have all the power and we need to do something to put things the way they need to be. Very effective. I talk a lot, I know on History Matters about the power of emotion in a variety of different ways, about emotion and politics. I've talked recently about hate and the ways that hate can be a really, really efficient political tool. Fear can be manipulated in a similar kind of a way, but in a sense, it's even sneakier. Because if you're using it really skillfully, then you're, you're acting as though you are in a position of weakness and you're demanding protection. All of these ways of casting politics can bring out a kind of primal response in people that like hate can lead to extremism in one way or another, but it's even more, it's even cagier in a sense. It's even, can be even more subtle. And so I think you see it discussed all the time in the media, in the press, in the news, um, the sort of politics of victimization that we are often seeing um, very often on the right. Um, and I think as I'm suggesting here, it's a, it's a very cagey power move. We are being victimized. We are, that's about people who are afraid of losing the power they feel entitled to having. They're not being victimized or they are, if by being victimized, what they mean is, we should be in power unquestionably here. Who are these people making these demands and, and suggesting that the order should change? The, the, the order, the social order should change. The political order shouldn't change. It, it's fine the way it is. As a matter of fact, it's even better the way it has been in the past. So let's do what it takes to keep it where it is or even move it back a couple steps in, in American history. That's not as attractive a message as help. We're being victimized. We must do something. And as always here on History Matters, I make that point um, because it, it, it's a really easy one to overlook. I think it, it gets fear and, and, and casting yourself as a victim gets grabs at or can potentially grab at a, a real guttural level of response in people who are hearing that message. So in the here and now, when you're listening to what people are saying in their arguments, when you're looking at how they're justifying violence or extreme actions, you know, we have to get these people, these people are out to destroy America. We must kill them. We must hurt them. We must do horrible things to them because they are upsetting the order. They are victimizing us. That can be very, a very effective and cagey and, and frighteningly effective way of basically saying to people, we deserve to have the power we have now attack these people that are taking it from us. That's what that message is saying. That's all that is at the heart of this kind of cagey, deliberate political victimization talk. At its heart, what it's saying is these people are threatening our power and our, we are the people who should have power. That's the way things should be, right? That's, that's safe and proper. That's the way things should be. That's what our nation should be. So let's go out and because we must, because we're victims and the nation is a victim, we must go out and attack and defeat the people who are threatening that order. That's not um, a democratic viewpoint, right? A democratic viewpoint in a, in a functioning democracy, you have free and fair elections where ideas are contested, candidates are contested, people vote their votes all count. And at the end of that kind of contest, someone wins. And sometimes that contest goes in one direction and sometimes that contest goes in another direction. And sometimes it goes in a direction that you do not like. And if it's a free and fair election, that's democracy. You don't control the way democracies move, right? Democracies are supposed to be grounded on and guided by public opinion, the public people having a vote, expressing that vote, those votes being counted. Now there are all kinds of ways, and I won't go into them now, in which with the electoral college and everything else, that's already kind of screwy, right? Already where our, our electoral system has some problems at its center. But if you are really, really messing fundamentally with the, the not just the electoral system, but people's faith in the electoral process, and if you're suggesting to them something's really wrong with it and you can tell it's really wrong with it because we might lose, 
that's a problem. <laughs> that's, that's a politics of victimization. That's not democracy. In democracy, you might lose. And in a free and fair election, if you do lose, that means something and you learn from that and you act based on that. And then you have another election in which you can respond to what's happening. And democracy is an ongoing conversation. It's an ongoing give and take. It's an ongoing discussion, argument even, but it, it, it's not inevitable in a democracy. What's inevitable when you're getting to inevitable leadership, inevitable power, you're no longer in the land of democracy. You're in the land of authoritarianism and people who are finding ways to justify doing whatever it takes to remain in power. That's what you need to keep your eyes on when you're looking out in the world. You know, as always, I say, if, if when, you, when you feel outraged by something that someone throws at you, political rhetoric, I always say, pause for a moment and think about what that person might gain by you being upset because very often, that might not be a sincere expression of anything. That might just be a form of propaganda to get you moving in the direction that they want. I think the same kind of logic holds true with this idea of victimization and fear. But always pause and think when someone is throwing that kind of language about, throwing that kind of language in your face to a degree that, you know, it's not even... It's not hidden or masked in any way that people are saying, you know, we are victims. We are victims of these scary people. Um, think about that when someone is presenting that. What is that telling you about what the people who are claiming to be victimized feel is their right? What are they telling you about what they feel the correct order of things are? And what are they seemingly justifying by using that kind of language? Basically, the, the larger message here is if people are tossing around in a really deliberate, obvious, blatant, aggressive way, um, the, the politics of feeling, the politics of emotion, that's a, that's a guttural way to grab at you and motivate you. Always has been, always will be. If you see that happening, that's always a moment to pause and think about what the real underlying dynamic is. What's going on there? What are the people using that kind of language trying to get you to do without thinking about it, but responding gutturally? Hey, wait a minute, they're being victimized. This is scary, we must act. That's, that's not a process of deliberation. That's not a process of democratic give and take. That's a gut response. This is bad, we will act. Not the most ideal way to behave. And as I've already said a number of times, I'll stop saying it now, um, not really democratic. So the key here, and I suppose the, the ultimate message, and I'm going to stop so we have time for questions, um, is that the language of victimization, the talk of victimization, that you are being attacked, that you are afraid of these scary others, very often is a power ploy, can be a power play. And, and it's important to know that and to think about that and to recognize it while it's happening, rather than just being swept up in the emotion of that kind of claim, which can really push people to taking extreme action of a kind that without that kind of sort of guttural grab, you would never fall into, you would never justify, you would never move in that direction. Um, I, you know, I'm not gonna repeat some of what I've seen floating around in the news uh, and at um, some events, uh, particularly in the case of this last week, I think on the right in which there has been talk of violence, we have to do something. These people, they're horrible, they're threats, we must get them. They are victimizing us and the nation and we can use our guns is essentially some of the talk that I saw floating around online this week. That's precisely what I'm talking about here. That's bypassing logic, process, politics, democracy. That's bypassing it all and just saying scary, bad, victim. We need violence to fix it. Never a good place to go, but an easy place to fall into if you're not thinking about the dynamics at the heart of it. So in a sense, that's what I'm talking about this morning. That's what I'm encouraging, a, a new kind of self-awareness uh, on our part to think about the language, think about the words, think about the logic and the emotion of what's going on around us because that's where a lot of the power lies right now. That's where a lot of power is being deployed and I think it's very easy to miss it. Um, I, I think I'll stop there. I'm already like five minutes over what I'm supposed to do. I got a little worked up. Um, but anyway, that's, that's, that's the scary story uh, for the conversation this morning is that fear uh, is very effective uh, and can be subtle. Uh, and can sneak in under your radar 
and can motivate people to do things that if you reason with them, they would never think is proper to do. So I will, I will stop there. Um, I will, I, I, I was going to say, I do, I, before even looking, Carolee has to ask for the mug and this is proper. Um, I will, if there's anyone here who's new, um, what we do every week or what I do every week. So this, oh, I forgot. This is what Carolee, is it our 82nd straight history matters? Is it, are we doing this for 82 straight weeks? I think 80 something um, at any rate. We've been doing, oh, 82. Okay, so we have been doing this for 82 straight weeks. I tell you every week, I'm gonna be very proud of this. For 82 straight weeks, um, I bring a mug uh, to the conversation that in some way or another has something to do with the conversation. Now, this one's gonna be a little problematic. So you're gonna to have to take my word for what the mug actually says, um, <laughs> because it's gonna look like this. <laughs> this is actually, um, I don't know if you could see this here. It says Hamilton fired first. It is a mug that like when you put coffee in it, uh, it shows an image of the Burr-Hamilton duel. It says NCHE and says Hamilton fired first. So it is actually a mug of fear, but my coffee is cold now. <laughs> I, I thought about, it's right. It's a, it's a, let me open chat here. It's a Hamilton mood mug, which I adore. <laughs> But when I chose it this morning, I was like, dang, like, what am I going to do? Run to my kitchen and put it in the microwave. <laughs> <laughs> so trust me, it is a mug of fear. Um, and maybe the, the, the dark color, the somber color about the <laughs> our message, I'll, I'll justify it that way. But um, that is the mug of choice for, for today. Okay, now. Matt, Matt has a background that is somehow related, and I, I see that many are stumped. Yes, this is only marginally related. This is a total fun one, because um, <laughs> I wasn't quite sure what direction Joanne was going to go with the, the topic. So sometimes I can guess, and I'm like, oh, I think we're probably going to talk about that person, and I can get that in there. Um, it is that. British. I, I... <laughs> it is British. This is uh, the oh. Marlowe House. Uh, where Mary Shelley completed Frankenstein. So this- and, Okay, no, that's good. So that's it, it's, it's appropriate, it's fear, it's, you know, it's, it's Halloween, you could, but- Totally, you could have been like total academic, like it is about fear of humankind. <laughs> <laughs> it's Nietzsche's house, no, it's- <laughs> no, You could have gone there, Frankenstein is a story. Yes. Fear in the human condition. You totally could have academic it up there, Matt. <laughs> no, I, I, I went. I went total humanities here. This was, uh, <laughs> but it's 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 one of my favorite horror quote unquote horror books because it she leaves all of the science out of it. She just it just sort of you know like the, the that's what I love about it. You know, it's just sort of part of the story that like she doesn't explain how you know, he create, you know, creates this monster. So I know. It's pretty, it's amazing. I mean, that all by itself, you know, I, yeah. I was an English literature major in college. So some part of me always drifts in that direction. <laughs> anyway, it's part of why I'm so plugged into language all the time. Right. I, right. I was an English literature person. And so. I, I did have another idea, but I'll, I'll save that for the after party because it's, uh, it's, it's, it was a, a jokey one. So I'll tell you about okay. that one later. Well, keep us in suspense. For that. <laughs> Okay. All right. Well, we do have lots of good questions. So, um, oh, someone oh. just got bingo. Yeah. Apparently, me saying after party triggered oh. bingo for several people. I, I, there's <laughs> one here who's new. There is bingo that is played here every week. Um, and it, it, words like after party and partner in crime. And um, I won't say anything else because it's going to give some other people bingo. But um, <laughs> yes, uh, there's bingo being played. And um, I love the fact that suddenly, randomly in the chat, bingo! <laughs> okay, questions. I uh, love it. Okay, um, so this is, I'm, Dave uh, wrote a long question, and it, it's a good one. But okay. before I read it, I'm just going to frame it by saying, um, the question is ultimately about the Stamp Act. Okay. Okay. Because uh, just keep that in mind as I read. because it's, it's, it's in the back of my head. Yeah, okay, great. Um, who was entitled to what land? Native Americans or colonists? The colonists were afraid of the people from whom they stole the land. Meanwhile, England had to protect the colonists from the Native Americans because colonists were stealing land and many of the founders were land speculators. So 
was the real purpose of the Stamp Act to fund British troops keeping Native Americans and colonists away from each other? Um, well, okay, so I'll, there's a I'll lot that, that, that's why I said there's, there's a lot there. There's a lot, there. There's a lot uh, to unpack. That is a lot to unpack. Some of the acts that were being passed that were being protested against among the colonists um, were indeed about gaining some income to deal with the protection and regulation of the colonies. It's also a period of time when the British Empire was kind of refiguring its financial order in one way or another. And so that's also some of what was coming into play here. And in one way or another, and on both counts, it represented a form of change to some of the colonists that they saw as being different, <laughs> unjustified and, and worth responding against. So, so the, it's the partial yes in response to that, that question is that there, the changes that were going on in part had to do with the British empire reconfiguring its sort of financial structure, number one, and number two, also dealing with situations in their colonists, their North American um, colonies uh, that required particular kinds of funding. And some of that had to do with protecting um, colonists or you know, maintaining uh, troops there. That was some of what was going on, but not all of what was going on. Excellent. Um, so, <clears throat> and I, I'm not sure how much you can or want to comment on this, but Catherine asks a question um, about the I'm gonna turn because you talked a little bit about victim and hood, victimhood. So the couple questions are, are related to that. Um, Joanne's example about using fear via acting as victim sounds so much like the way Hitler talked in the 1930s. Hmm. And his rise to power was partly on the back of a nationalistic idea based on being angry about the reparations German, Germany was forced to pay, et cetera. Isn't that similar to the way that some folks are shifting in Congress now um, and through um, some of, do, do you see that happening now, I guess is the ultimate question without reading exactly here. That, that people in Congress are um, perceiving themselves and- those As that, victims, yes. As victims. Yeah, I mean, I do, you know, I, I, um, I never like to sort of en encompass enormous groups of people and say they you know right um, are there people on the right in congress who are using that kind of logic yeah there are some for sure um you know i mean i think i think there are different kinds of people in different kinds of ways who are deploying that kind of logic and yeah i do think that there you know i and i think this is an interesting thing that i didn't talk about but i thought about this morning um how, you know, let's for, talk for the moment about um, how some members of Congress are talking about January 6th, right? That's a problem because that's a thing that was done by supporters of people on the right. So how do you make that so that you're not the aggressor, but that you're the victim? Well, maybe you suggest that it's justified because the government is tyrannical and thus you are justified because you are the victim of the government, or maybe you find a way to blame those events on people that aren't right. you, right? And it's like, oh, well, you know, not only are we being victimized generally, but these other evil people carried it out and are pretending to be us. That, that's another example of sort of victimization being used to manipulate your, your sense of what actually happened and the dynamics of it. So in one way or another, yeah, I think that victimization is kind of the name of the game right now mm -hmm. um, it, it, for certain people in politics. And right now it's being used a lot on the right because I think right now there are some people on the right who truly feel that the political and social order that they want to be in place is under threat. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do you maintain that? How do you keep things in such a state so that a certain kind of person, and there are many of those people who will be white and male, um, but still, how do you keep the order in a way that feels like it should be that way to you and keep out these people who, to you, you feel are threatening the proper order of things. And I just think victimization, the, the rhetoric and logic of victimization and the emotion of that is a really effective way to do that um, because it, it, by definition, portrays the people you're against as the bad guys. And you are the victimized, virtuous, good guy. Mm -hmm. And that's an effective stance, right? That's an effective rhetoric to use. It's all around us and, and I, which is why I, I partly, I'm talking about that this morning because I just think it's easy to overlook um, that that's the real logic of what we're 
living in the middle of right now um, because it's so persuasive, right? You, you naturally, if you feel that someone is being victimized, some part of you is naturally like, well, that's not fair. Unless you examine that a little bit and think about um, who's saying what and why and what it means. As a follow-up to that, Miranda um, wonder, wondered, as a citizen, how do you separate victimhood from actual victimization? Um, Moran, she says, I, I can feel victimized as a rural American, for example, but how do you separate a real victimization from a creative one? Well, and that's a really good question. Yeah. Um, you know, I think in part, it's going to seem like a fudgy kind of answer. In part, it has to do with reality, right? I mean, are you, is there a real way in which, um, you know, fundamentally something is being taken from you, not like your entitlement to power? but um, you know, your right to vote. That's, you know, that's a right, that's not, that's not a dramatically contested, you know, it shouldn't be contested. It's kind of fundamental to what our Republic is. You should have that right to vote. Is that being taken away from you? Well, then that, it does suggest that you are being victimized in some way. In a way, I almost wanna say that, that victim, the V word might just not be the best first way, place to go, right? And really to think about, um, how things are supposed to work and how they actually are working and what the, what, how those things are bumping up against each other. And before you take it to the sort of personal victim emotional level to really think in a broader sense about what's actually happening, about the, the power dynamic of what's happening as opposed to the emotion dynamic that using victim logic frames it in. So, you know, the other thing that I didn't talk about this morning, and I suppose that I could have also is um, conspiracy theories, which are not unrelated to this idea about victimization, right? That there's like some evil plot going on with people doing things behind the mm -hmm. scenes that are illicit and are, they're going to get what they want. And you know, it's it somehow or other, you don't quite know what it is, but it's out there and it's bad. You know, that's in a sense, that's a, a different form of, of victimization thinking and, and fear mongering, right? It's a different way of doing it, but very similar. Again, you know, kind of along the lines of what I started out by saying in my comments this morning, hardly new logic, right? You can go, there's a whole scholarly literature on conspiracy theories and paranoid thinking and, you know, throughout all of American history, how effective that has been. It's worth saying, um, you know, as a matter of fact, speaking about fear of democracy, part of what led people like Hamilton to be fearful about democracy is, is everything that we're talking about here. In their mind, um, what made a, a democratic republic vulnerable was the fact, the very thing that made it distinctive and that supposedly was better about it, which is popular rule, that the people matter, the people govern popular opinion rules, which is all nice and good. But what it also means is that the people can be riled up and, and roused up and swayed in one way or another by crafty demagogues and then horrible bad things can happen. It's why, you know, demagogue was like the ultimate horrible thing you could say about someone in this time period, because that was the sort of person that took advantage of the fact that the public can be emotionally moved so easily, would do that to claim power. And then once that person had power, do whatever, and at that period it would have been he, wanted to do with that power. So conspiracy thinking, demagoguery, that's all also part of the same, um, what do I want to call it? Um, portrait of, of emotion and fear mongering as a way of gaining power. And it has was always, as long as there's been an American democratic republic has been recognized as something that is a fundamental threat to the way it operates. Uh, and that has been proven time and time again over the course of American history. <clears throat> um, so continuing along these lines, it, Karen, I'm going to um, turn your question just a little bit. Uh, uh, Karen wanted you to talk about how COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic impacted cur the current culture of fear. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to turn it just a shade, which was, um, you know, we've talked about, there have been other pandemics, especially in the founding era that, um, and, and how, how did how did those use how, or how did folks use that those pandemics was it different than how we see some folks using the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of talking about victimization and fear and 
Well, for I'll start with now and then I'll move back. So, Perfect. So, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> no. So, but but so for now, what's interesting actually, it's an interesting example because um, fear, um, often at least, some of the ways in which fear is being roped into um, conversation and thoughts about the pandemic is people on the extreme right making fun of people on the left for being afraid. Right. So it's like, oh, you're, you know, you're, you lives, you're like afraid of this, you're fear mongering, you're, you know, that th th there is some of that conversation that goes on among some people that fear, um, if you're, you're fearful, you're, you're weak and you shouldn't be fearful and you should be, you know, it's not a big deal and you're making it a big deal. And for either no reason or because you're using it to claim power, whatever the logic is for people who sort of abide by that argument. Um, so, you know, it, it, there's a, a different sort of mechanism for how people are using fear or shaming people for being afraid. It really does show you how you mm -hmm. can, you can use fear from all sides uh, to, to sort of gun for people's emotions and get them to respond. Um, in the earlier period, the first thing that my mind jumped to when you were talking about fear and pandemics, um, and it's not going to surprise you at all, but that is, you know, if you think, for example, of the big yellow fever mm -hmm epidemic of, I think it's 1793 um, in Philadelphia, one of the things that happens in the case of that um, epidemic uh, is that white people convince themselves that black people are not susceptible to yellow fever and thus ask black uh, Americans to like deal with the sick and nurse the sick because they're not susceptible in the way that white people are, which mm -hmm. is not true, but that's a case in which um, race and racism and, and a pandemic get bound up pretty quickly with each other. There's actually, there was at one point at which I was gonna talk about that one week um, for History Matters because there's a pamphlet war about that. Mm -hmm. um, and there are a good number of um, black Philadelphians who step forward and are like, you know, we always help out the community. So what's this about, you know, really mm -hmm. like this is, um, but so that's an, a long roundabout way of saying um, fear in that case, fear is just very handy finger pointing. Well, these people will deal with it all, right? Cause we, we, we can't be affected by this. We are vulnerable to it, but these people aren't. So let's just leave it to them. Um, it's another way of using fear and pandemics or epidemics um, in ways that confound logic, but that seem to make sense if you're in an environment where, you know, I mean, um, epidemics of disease are helpful in making people not think logically. I mean, I will be the first to say that, you know, I'm sure like most people out there, right? It, it, how can you not be made nervous or fearful about this thing that, you know, mm -hmm. is hovering out around us and we don't ever fully really know what's going on and it seems to be going away, but we're not sure. These are weird times. And so it's very easy um, to be fearful without even thinking about it, which is part of why I raised this topic today. Uh, how are we doing? Oh, we got a few minutes left. Um, so James Stewart. I, I wanna read this just oh. from Beth uh, yes, um, before we get back. I saw it too. A, yeah, um, Beth uh, Short says, let's not forget that fear mongering doesn't come out of nowhere. Minority groups who dare, who have the temerity to assert their legal rights or to object to being demonized, trigger the insecurities that invoke these reactions from the power elite. Absolutely. And that's part of really what I was trying to say this morning is it's fear of these groups taking away what the those with power feel that they deserve that triggers this. It's definitely not coming out of nowhere. It's fear of people who actually are simply saying, yeah, we have rights too. We have rights. <laughs> That's not, a, it's actually not a radical statement to say that it's a, it's, you know, um, but it's made a radical statement by people who feel that that's a threat, but that's right. a really good point that I wanted to be sure to um, reiterate because that's certainly part of what I was trying to say in my comments this morning. And this is particularly important because there are, we, we do have a lot of people who watch this after the fact and don't, aren't privy to the chat, which is. Um, ah, I, it's true. I don't think about that, but so that was good because that was a, um, a very clear way of saying what I was saying in a variety yeah. of different ways. Well, I'm going to turn James James Stewart ask a question, and um, <clears throat> I'm going to just turn it just a little bit. Um, James Stewart, who is not my cousin, we've had this conversation in the past. Um, in early America, particularly New England, the fear of the Native Americans partly led to in 
to internal accusation of witchcraft and finding scapegoats. Um, his question is about how do those play out today? And we've, we've talked a little bit about that already. So my question is, uh, can we talk about the idea of scapegoating as it pertains to fear? I think it's a good, uh, which you, you've touched on a little bit today, but I, I want can we tease it out just a little bit more? Um, and, and I don't know, I don't know if you want to talk about, you know, the Salem witch trials and some of those issues, but, um, sort of the, the scape, not just scapegoating in terms of, of a particular population or what we call the other, but also sort of the mis the mysticism that, that underlies that, the unknown that underlies that, if you could just talk a little bit about that, um, and how that's still a prevalent issue. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a power to that too, right? If you can effectively convince people um, of a, a group or a person um, is, you know, the scapegoat is actually responsible despite the fact that they aren't, you know, if, mm -hmm. if you are, um, you are selling, you are pitching security that way, right? You're like, well, here's the thread. It's in this little box. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, you're not saying I will scapegoat this and it will feel better to you, but that's essentially what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So um, in the course of the Salem witch trials, there are things going on that people are uneasy about and they find a way to create a group of people that they can blame it on. And then right. they can sort of deal with them violently when necessary. And then somehow or other that makes people feel that things are being put under control, which is as you're suggesting and as the question suggests, clearly part of the same logic um, of, mm. of fear mongering. That's in some way you feel that things are out of control. The normal order is out of control. You want the normal order back. Very often you want the normal order in which you're at the top and in power back. And so um, conspiracy thinking and fear mongering and um, all of this kind of behavior is a way of deploying emotion to grab back the order in which you want things to be. And by definition, that's a very powerful thing among people who already have power, the power to make that message, to spread that message, to enforce the implications of that message. So there's a reason why that works so well. Uh, no, I, I think that's a great point. I, you know, I, what's fascinating to me about is this is like that, and, and we see them today as sort of the, you know, that, that unknown component where you say, well, you know, in, in case of witchcraft, for example, well, you know, it's, it's magic, it's, you know, and I'm the only one who really understands this. And so I'm telling you, you know, so it's, it's using fear to become an authority on something um, and institutionalize. And know, to tell people that they have no way themselves of dealing with it, right? You exactly. Need to look yeah. to the institutions and the people in power uh, to deal with this because they are the ones, but that's very much in line with um, the, the sort of New England church generally right which right. for a long time was grounded on the fact that um the the uh preachers the people in power the clergy are the ones who understand things and can read things and can interpret things and they are the learned people and that others need to look to them mm -hmm. and that's the threat inherent in things like um you know baptists and methodists and other forms of religion that say no actually <laughs> <laughs> it's not just the learned clergy that you can look to. It's actually more democratic than that. It's another way of this playing out, but it's the same kind of um, power mongering in addition mm -hmm. to, to fear mongering, for sure. Um, I also want to mention, where did I just see this? Scott. Lori House Anderson's book, um, Fever 1793 Examines How the Black Community Responded to Yellow Fever. Um, and that there's historical information at the book's end. So I wanted to mention that too. I hadn't thought until a moment ago, Matt, when you're like, people can't see the conversation if they're watching this. <laughs> it's like, dang, I never, 82 weeks and I haven't really thought yeah, I know. about that, So <laughs> I literally just thought of it myself. So I was... yeah. So I'm um, sorry, guys, if we haven't, I'll, I'll, I generally will sometimes try and mention what people say, but I'll try and be a little bit more tuned into the fact that there are things that could be read aloud. Yeah. Those who are- yeah, I tend to view chat as sort of this, this is like the icing on the cake for you to actually join us live, that you get the opportunity to interact. But every once in a while, like 
like what Beth had today. It was just yeah, really- no, it I totally agree. It is. Yeah. It, it and I, you know, it's very when I'm speaking, it's actually really hard because um even though I turn off, but right now I have chat open along the side, I'll turn uh, it off, but it's still on the bottom. I can see people making comments and I have to be like, you know, some part of me wants to <laughs> because I so want to engage with you all and I have to pretend like I'm not seeing it. Put but, a little post-it note over it. <laughs> but that's probably not a bad idea. Not a bad idea. Well, I, Melissa, we haven't, we haven't uh, um, heard from Melissa in a while. So let me ask her question. Okay. I think it's one that you're, you will uh, have some input on. Uh, she says, dueling from my perspective violates the right to life. If we pointed that out, would they have changed? So sort of a hypothetical, so if, if we had argued, or if people had argued that dueling is a violation of the right to life. Great question, um, and and the answer is um, the answer is complicated. It's very historical, <laughs> um, but it, it's something I thought about when I was first writing about dueling because um, it's 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 you know attempted murder or murder, so um, it's against the law. It's also not particularly Christian, right, to engage in that kind of behavior, whether you're engaging in murder or um, if somehow or other suicide by duel, which really is not a thing, but still in that way too, it, it's it's not. Um, religiously proper either, people knew that it, it was violating the, the sort of civil society, the, the legal code. They knew that it was um, violating religion and religious principles. They knew that also, generally speaking, they didn't want to die. They knew all of these things. So the, the short answer to the question is, would that have made a difference is no. <laughs> and, but it's one of the things that um, fascinated me about dueling to begin with is that given everything that I just said, given that if you do it, you know you're not being a good Christian, you know that you're violating and you're breaking the law, particularly if you're a lawmaker, <laughs> that's an issue. Mm -hmm. You know that you might die, you know that you might leave your family without money or support, you know all of these things and you do it anyway. The question is then, what is so motivating that would drive you to do it despite all of those things? That's what initially intrigued me about dueling was, um, there has to be a really good reason why people do it if they can acknowledge that all of those things are true and do it anyway, and which has a lot to do with um, these men who feel that that's really who they are is what's at stake. And if they don't defend their reputation and their manhood, none of the rest matters. Their family will spurn them. Their religion won't matter. They'll be worthless. They'll be, you know, you can look at, if you're interested to see this logic in action, look at, um, Hamilton's um, statement about the duel, you can find it on Founders Online, um, in which he explains why he's fighting the duel. And he both he works his way right through. Like you might say it's you know not good for a Christian to do this. And you might say, you know, I'm a father, and you might say he explains all of the reasons why he shouldn't be doing it. And then in the last paragraph, explains why he is and basically says, because um, what men of the world denominate honor. You know, what people conceive of as honor is necessary if you're going to be a leader and in future crises that this nation might happen, I am one of those leaders and I need to defend my honor and reputation so that I can be useful in those future crises when they happen. That's how he ultimately sort of comes down in explaining it at its heart. What he's saying is I need to defend my reputation because without it, I'm nothing and can't do anything. So mm -hmm. as logical as it might seem to say, you know, yeah, but right to whatever, all your rights are being violated. It's like, yes, but um, even more important than that is this, this fundamental thing. Um, I see that we've sort of be meandered our way beyond the normal end. It is. Um, we're, we're right at, we're right about when we normally. We are right. It, okay. So, so um, let me, uh, I see, there you go. Carolee is like, bam, there's the link in Founders Online to find Hamilton's statement because this is what our community does. Thank you, Carolee. Um, I will say here, um, that uh, for those of you uh, who want to join us, we are now going to segue um, into the after party uh, in a moment. Um, what that means is that we will no longer be recording what's going on so we can be a little bit more free and easy in our conversation. Um, if you have joined us through NCHE, their website, ncheteach.org slash conversations, just stay right here. And I saw someone mention this before and poof, it will become the after party. If you are on Facebook, have joined us on Facebook, you need to leave Facebook. 
uh, and go to nche.teach.org slash conversations to join us in the after party, at which point we will talk about whatever it is the heck we want to talk about. Um, and again, great way to continue being part of this amazing History Matters community. I sing your praises all the time on Twitter and, and with other historians because you guys are amazing. And the fact that we could create this history community and sustain it this way and be here for each other this way, um, it makes me uh, happier and prouder than I can say. Um, and is, as I say every week, um, a wonderful shining example of uh, democracy in action because we are thinking about and talking about the way that our nation is functioning or malfunctioning in one way or another. Um, and that's part of the democratic process is thinking about it, talking about it, being aware of it, and then acting on it. Um, so I will, I will let Matt say farewell. I don't want to beam out without Matt saying goodbye too, but I will say, as I always say, thank you guys as always um, for coming and uh, keeping this community going. Uh, we have a special thing going here and I hope you all have a wonderful week. And um, I hope that many of you will stick around for the after party. I can't possibly top that, that so I'm just <laughs> going to say thank you everybody for coming and uh, look forward to seeing you next week. Now comes the poof.